You're listening to Staying in the Game, a Plum Dragon Herbs podcast where we have conversations about mindset and techniques for staying at the top of your game. I'm your host, Janelle Leatherwood. We're speaking today with Master Piscina, a martial arts master, multimedia choreographer, and actor. But Master Piscina is perhaps best known for playing the original Johnny Cage and several ninjas in the first two Mortal Kombat games. He has also worked on films such as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze, Book of Swords, Press Star, and Mortal Kombat Fate's Beginning. In addition to continuing his personal practice, he teaches weekly martial arts classes in Chicago and travels throughout North and South America to teach seminars on martial arts and choreography. Welcome to our show. We're so excited to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to be here. Finally, it took us a long time to get connected because yeah. uh, I'm I'm really unorganized. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think everybody's everybody's feeling a little bit unorganized and off kilter with you know everything going on during this pandemic. Yeah, uh, it's it is a little strange out, but you know uh, we'll get through it together. Yeah. We'll get through it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's great to have you on our show. And we have um, a lot of martial artists that use our flagship product, D.Jow. And that was kind of how we found you in the first place, because we understand that you like to use that in your training. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, I wanted to find out, how did you get into martial arts? Um, Actually, when I was younger, uh, at a young age, I was on Sunday. There used to be a, a show called Jackie, I mean, uh, Charlie Chan, the detective. It was a black and white show. And uh, during one of the episodes, uh, I used to watch it with my father. So I'm watching this guy solve a crime. And there's this big thug that comes out. Uh, naturally, it's a stunt guy. But uh, uh, Charlie Chan throws him with a judo throw. <laughs> like I see him flying through the air. And it's amazing to me because there's this short, chubby guy throwing this really big, muscular stunt guy, uh, you know. So I was just like, holy cow, I want, really want to learn that. And my dad served in the, uh, the U.S. military for the Korean War. So he actually taught me my first throw. He taught me how to do like a shoulder throw. And, and, uh, and that's all he taught me. And I kept on bugging him, bugging him to try to take martial art lessons because, uh, I, you know, I really felt a connection with it. And uh, fi- finally, after watching Bruce Lee and the Green Hornet, uh, my dad was like, okay, I'm going to take this guy to, to, to get some lessons. So that's how my journey began. Oh, so, awesome. So that is awesome. Was, was there a, a moment later on in your path where you realized, wow, I really want to make martial arts my life? Was there like a specific moment that sticks out to you? You know, it just, I just like the martial art uh, I think it's because, you know, I'm a middle child. So I have older brothers and naturally older brothers don't want to hang out with you. <laughs> and, I have a, and I have a younger brother, but he didn't come till much later. So mm-hmm. I was basically by myself getting beat up by my brothers. And I thought eventually I will learn how to defend myself and I'm going to throw my, my brothers around. But in reality, uh, the martial art teaches you not to do that. So I never got to do that. <laughs> I never got my revenge. But, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but that came yeah. later, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but through through the whole thing, I just really enjoyed that that what the martial arts has to offer because it's a you can learn it in a group, but it's really about yourself and self discovery, and you're you're doing that through through a group of class and through uh, people, and it teaches you discipline and not to you know and to try to really in the end get along with each other. You know, you have to work work together to learn learn it because otherwise you can't really apply it at the beginning to a person who doesn't want it to be applied to. That's a skill. You know, you get that after time. So I really, really loved it. Mm-hmm. And so, what is? Oh, go ahead. Oh no, you you go ahead. I was just going to ask, what is the main focus of your martial arts? Because I know there's probably a hundred different types of martial arts styles. Is it judo that you focus on? Um, no, actually, it's, uh, I do uh, traditional Chinese martial arts now, but uh, when I view martial arts, I view all traditional martial arts, whether it's 
uh, Thai or from uh, Japan or or from Korea. All all traditional martial arts are really the same. It's it's really the uh, I had instructors tell me it's really the seasoning. He goes, you could take a piece of chicken, and un unless you add a specific uh, seasoning to it, you cannot get barbecue chicken or teriyaki chicken. But in the end, the meat of it is still the same. So with a traditional martial art, r they're really all the same. It's, it's when you dive into the sport martial art that makes them different. Because in sport martial art, you add, start adding rules. You know, uh, uh, so when you get to, and there's nothing wrong with that because we need that for martial arts to grow. Uh, uh, and get get students, but that is really the difference uh, with it. When you you have a you make it a sport, you apply rules and you change the schematics of it. You know, uh, that's why uh, you know in Taekwondo uh, there's no you can't throw an elbow, but in Thai mm -hmm. you can throw an elbow, but you don't really throw. But in Swai, uh, but in Sanda and MMA, uh, what's known as MMA, you can throw and joint lock. But so you know it's just a play on it, and it's just. I think it's just, uh, that's cool. It makes it really popular. But in the end, the traditional stuff is really all the same. Yeah. How did all the martial arts experience that you had lead to you getting into gaming and um, becoming the persona for this huge Mortal Kombat series? Uh, actually, I'm a, like a, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I'm a martial art geek. <laughs> I'm a martial art geek, but I'm also, uh, when I was younger, uh, my uh uh, my older brother collected comics, so he passed that down to me to collect comics, and I passed that down to my younger brother, Carlos, who is Raiden from the from the video game, to collect comics, and he would like to draw. So uh, he and a group of friends would draw together at my mother's kitchen table, basically, and one of those guys was John Tobias, and that's how I got introduced. Uh, later on, when he grew up, he knew me as the martial art guy. Uh, and he's the one who who made me that gave me that connection to be in the game. If I would help him create the game. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so we, oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just saying. So in the end, it, you know, as we we really know it, it's all about you uh, connections. You have to have uh, 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 good connections. But two, he, uh, I used to drive him and my brother to see movies and pick them up after afterwards. And sometimes I'd go to movies with them. I played Dungeons and Dragons with them. So really, mm -hmm. it, he trusted me to, you know, not only was I a martial art guy, but it was like a like a trustworthy guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what are some of like the favorite contributions that you made to Mortal Kombat? Because I know you were really integral in the creative side of that. Developing yeah. the personalities and some of the yeah. moves. Yeah, and when we were uh, when we were pitching the idea to to Midway, uh, that was part of our agreement. John was like, "I can't pay you a lot, but you can put anything into the game you want to put, and we'll make it work." So the first thing I did was uh, because it's the it was the late '90s. Uh, everything is ninja. Everything's Japanese ninja. Shokushugi was out there big. Uh, the American Ninja, the, uh, there was all, all types of ninjas, and I loved those guys, but I really wanted to make the game unique. So I knew, I, I had a book that was called uh, uh, Art of the Vagabond, Legend of the Lin Kuei. So I told John to change the Japanese ninjas into the Lin Kuei, which is what Scorpion and Sub-Zero and Reptile all look like, except for John... When he was doing it, he's like, well, I'm going to have to add color because otherwise you can't really see it when we're filming stuff. It's too, the uniform being all black, there's, there's no contrast. So I'm going to have to change it to color. And so he picked yellow. But basically my idea, uh, uh, one of the comp contributions to it was putting the Lin Kuei, the mystery of the Lin Kuei clan into Mortal Kombat and, and creating that look and the moves for Scorpion and Sub-Zero. So, and in the end, that is, they are the... Uh, they're the, the uh, whenever you see Mortal Kombat, you see the, those two as the symbol for Mortal Kombat. And that is just, I mean, it's just so fascinating, you know, to be you know, able to have a conversation with just, you know, one of the creators of just such an iconic franchise. So one question I kind of have for you in the nuts and bolts of the creation, what's one thing that when you guys were actually making the game, 
was a lot more difficult or a lot more tough than you previously thought going in when you guys were thinking up the ideas in terms of the creation? I think in the end, it was, nothing was, uh, the game was a success because nothing was really uh, super tough. It was difficult, but we had such a good team that we created ways to overcome any obstacle that we had in our way. You know, uh, again, it was a very low budget, and I think that really gave us the mindset that there was no, we had to think of a way to to create this game. There was no, you know, at the time, there was no Photoshop. There was no motion capture as we know it. You know, when people are actually playing the old games, they're actually controlling me personally, me, mm. bring, pictures and videos of me. So it's one of the first games where you can control a real person. So we just kind of tackled every problem uh, we could that came up just by just looking at it and as a as a community pulling together it was really a big collaboration so any problem we had we just kind of like thought of what uh, what was the best to make this game the best that's yeah. awesome so, so a quick follow-up to that do you guys have any mantras that you talked about or any sort of words to live by as you're going through that entire creative process well, because we were friends beforehand, we always would pick on each other, like <laughs> goofing. You know, we're, mm-hmm. it was like, we were like, even though, you know, uh, my brothers, uh, uh, we were all in our 20s, some lower, some upper, we would always be teasing each other, but not in a bad way, teasing, mm-hmm. each, other, teasing each other. Like uh, 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 an example is like uh, uh, John wanted to, Scorpion to light his opponent on fire, blow fire. And me being a smart aleck, when John told me, I want you to think of some way, cool way to blow fire. And I was like, and I would being a smart aleck was like, John, I can't blow fire because I'm wearing my mask and my whole head will be on fire. (laughs) And then he's like, don't be a smart a a hole. Basically, he's like, pull down your mask. And the guy who played Kano was like, Oh, what if you pull up the mask and it's a skeleton? And then I was like, oh, and that, and your head is on fire. So that was a kind of like a collaboration that happened, but we, all from goofing around, all from me saying, no, I won't do it because it'll light my head on fire. And, and, <laughs> and it turned into a skeleton whose head's on fire. So it was always, we were always goofing around like that. That's and fascinating. That, yeah. I'm sure that's what made it the more fun and more unique, you know? Yeah. 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 Now, a- oh, I was just going to say, now you've also done a lot of like um, stunts for movies and um, been in different films. And I've, I've heard you talk about, you know, maybe some films were more Hollywood than they were authentic, you know? Yeah. Uh, what do you feel like needs to go into a fighting movie to make it look more authentic and less Hollywood? I think right now it's time for the community to grow in a way where, uh, you know, and it, we were all in, uh, in Mortal Kombat, we were all inspired by the old Shaw brother movies. Uh, you know, uh, all the old five deadly venoms, uh, 36 chambers on those old movies, because all those guys knew martial arts and they, it wasn't just short clips. There were clips where they would be 18, 20 moves long, where they're just fighting boom, boom. And you see all the skill of, of that thing. And I think right now that that is lacking uh, because, you know, uh, when Jackie Chan came in, he did, he combined that with brawling, you know, getting hit and kind of brawling. And we've been doing that type of choreography and martial arts for over 25, 30 years now. So I think that now that that's, that standard should be changed back to having it more of like an artistic form uh, mm-hmm. of, 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 of filming as opposed to like the brawling uh, less, you know, it, it's cool. The stunts are cool, but that needs combined with the higher skill level. Yeah. I yeah. hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which characters... Or like, which people do you feel like inspired you? I guess you talked a little bit about that, but um, with in the beginning. But are there any other martial artists that inspired your work over the years? Actually, uh, uh, most uh, 
almost every martial artist who made a movie, I went, I paid money to see, and I kind of learned something from that. So it, even though I'm a, a more of a traditional guy rather than a mm-hmm. kickboxer guy, I paid to see Jean Claude Van Damme movies. I I paid to see uh, Steven Seagal movies, and mm-hmm. all all that just for the sake of mar- not only supporting the martial art commu- uh, community because they are martial artists. Uh, some better than others, but uh, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but still, to see what they're doing and to see their art or what they are creating. So, uh, and just learning from that. So, I, I though I saw a lot of movies. Again, I like the older movies, and I too I like the uh, the like the uh, uh, Jet Li and Donnie Yen movies that are kind of uh, take place uh, earlier in time. I really enjoy those movies because they, again, they're showing like an older skill, which I really like to see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, what do you think are like some of the biggest assumptions that people make about you that, you know, might not be true? Like, cause they see your persona and, you know, like, do, do people come up to you and expect you to be a certain way because of the characters that you've played? I think more often that people are surprised, I think because of my martial art background, uh, traditional martial art background, that after people meet me, they realize, they're like, man, you're really approachable. You know, mm-hmm. I have people come up, uh, you know, at, at uh, events like Comic-Cons and gaming events that are really shy to get my autograph. And then after I talk to them, they come back to the table like eight or nine times to have a chat because they're like, holy, holy cow, you're like a regular person. Mm-hmm. And and for me, I think like, yeah, I am a regular person. I just, you know, got involved with a project that that gave me a little bit of fame. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But in the end, in the end, my skin is just like, you know, your skin. It's, you know, a little rougher because I do iron palm training. You know, I use your stuff to do iron palm training every day. But, you know, but <laughs> basically, but basically it's the same. Yeah. You know, same as them. So, yeah. yeah. And what kind of like age group are you teaching? Like maybe they're too young to know who you are, but um, do you kind of incorporate some of your f- fun phrases from Mortal Kombat into your teaching and instruction? I I rarely do that because I think my students like to do that. Okay. They like they, they we, we goof around like you know get over here and, yeah. and, you know and then we you know to work out or so they just use those phrases over and over and over uh, again uh-huh. even even when you know afterwards if you know uh, if we're having a, a like a school barbecue they'll like finish him and come over and get another burger you know <laughs> it's kind of you know it's, it's they use it more teasingly and I think they really enjoy it more than. I do saying that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Absolutely. That is fun. I I have another question about your, you know, growing up within martial arts. Were there any lessons you learned early on, whether it be from an instructor or, you know, even from movies that you've kind of carried through your life as it relates to martial artists and martial arts in general? I have, I goof around with my students. And I'm, I have these weird, silly rules that I've actually, uh, I, uh, rule number one, exercise makes you tired. <laughs> so if you don't, if you not exercise, if you're not tired from exercising, then you weren't really exercising, <laughs> but they, and they're kind of obvious, uh, like rule number two, stretching makes you more flexible. So people who complain, oh, I'm not flexible. Well, you should stretch if you stretch more. And two, uh, I realized that uh, when I was younger, I would rather do conditioning, like rather have people kick me in the thighs and punch me in the stomach rather than stretch because stretching is really painful. Mm-hmm. So, so it's those things sound obvious, you know, uh, like and also if you practice, you get better, which sounds, you know, the, people are like naturally, but unless you really practice, you will not get better. And that's mm-hmm. good across everything. So I have these little goofing around things that I, that I have. And then I, sometimes I give them a number, you know, lesson number seven. And they're like, they kind of look at me, exercise makes you tired. You know, the, uh, the other day it was lesson number one, but now it's number seven. So it's always never really organized. But, but I have those things that uh, really, un, uh, unless you do them, you really don't really embrace them. 
Because mm-hmm. exercise... Exercise does make you tired. A lot of people like exercise gives me energy. No, after you're done with exercise, you're usually tired. But later on, you'll realize, oh, I have more endurance. So it's kind of yeah, it's, it's a weird philosophy. But that's yeah, my, that's my, basically how I look at it. I love yeah, I that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm gonna use those with my kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> when right. when they complain to me that they're too tired to work around the house, I'll, I'll say. Well, work is supposed to make you tired. <laughs> yeah, it, it, but it's true. It is yeah. 100% true. But then later on, it'll give you like that endurance, that energy. You know, yeah. and then you realize that work is not that bad. Everybody has to do it. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So you mentioned having like a couple half gallon jugs of the jow in your uh, yeah. gyms and stuff. Job. So what do you like to use and how do you guys use it in your gyms and training? I think I, I haven't ordered from you guys in a little, little bit because I like to order in big, bigger batches. Mm-hmm. So I usually keep two half gallon uh, jugs at the school and a half gallon jug in my home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they and, and again, uh, uh, I make sure that everyone who is going to do any type of conditioning uh, apply it because it's really important for you to keep your dexterity, you know, uh, without your product. Or without a jow or fam, or whether you have a recipe, and I've just finally, you know, I have a recipe, but I just find it easier, and and you, you have guys have a, a high standard, you know. Mm-hmm. I've tried a lot, I tried a lot, of, a lot of other jows out there, and they don't, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm kissing your butt, but it's true. But it, that's why I, I kind of use use it because it, it's really good stuff, and people need to apply it so that way they can write and not have those. Uh, keep your circulation and keep your normal, you know, not everybody's a professional martial artist and their hands should become hammers. And it's important for you to use uh, liniment to keep your training and to have a normal inconspicuous life. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, your hand, you know, uh, I don't know if you see it, but my knuckles are pretty big, but they don't look like some of the older guys who don't use a jaw and their hands look all kind of gnarly. Uh-huh. So, two, we use it for, you know, to, uh, to bruises, uh, if, you know, they start getting a bruise, you got to apply it and you got to rub it in. And, uh, and I think it's really important for, for any martial artist to, to apply it just in case. Yeah. You know, at my school, if somebody's going to be, you know, touching hands or, or, or conditioning, you got to put it on before and you have to put it on after because mm-hmm. uh, otherwise when you're complaining, don't be complaining. <laughs> yeah. There's another rule. Well, thank you very much for the phrase though. Great. Yeah. Great. That. Yeah, well deserved. You guys well deserved. What are what are some of the more common injuries that you guys are trying to prevent? More like uh, more just bruising because you know once you with especially with hand conditioning or body conditioning, if you get a bruise, then you don't want to condition because you got a bruise and that's not good to condition. You know, it could become a blood clot, and if it travels, you know, to to a certain part, you can really get injured. Yeah. So, so generally, uh, more more bruising from hitting or bumping or that general conditioning. Like right now, right now at this point, we don't really have any. Uh, uh, I make sure that uh, there's good supervision. So people rarely, I think in the last maybe 20 years of training, I had one person break an arm, mm-hmm. and, and and it was actually a kid who did tried to do an aerial cartwheel off the floor. And ran into a chair, and oh, then wow. so when he hit it, he put his hand down. Wow! And, and then he broke his wrist. Ooh. But that was the yeah. only injury that I've really had in the last 20 years because I make sure that you know the instructors or myself really supervise the uh, the classes that are going on because again, you, you know, uh, naturally I can hurt somebody because I've been doing martial arts for like 50 years. So yeah. naturally. And two, you have to be seasoned enough to like know that, no, we just shouldn't, you know, we're here to guide and protect people, not to bully them. Kind of like that. Uh-huh. Like, you know, the bullying a person is the lowest skill, you know. So we, at least in my school and my, and mm-hmm. my life. So we really try to watch out for each other and, and always remember that everyone learns differently. So you might excel at learning one thing, but then you slow down wearing, low, uh, slow down with some part of it. But that uh, the person next to you, who is slow at the beginning catches up because in the end it's it's it, that's what happens there's nobody who really gets something you know uh, in a short period of time that's why we call it kung fu skill and time 
you know, uh, so in the end, just, you know, t train uh, at, at your pace, but train for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. No, absolutely. Yeah. What, so what would be like the ultimate piece of advice that you give in your martial arts coaching? Uh, you have the instructor will give you tools and it's up to you to use those tools. Do your stretching. It's painful, but do it. You know, mm -hmm. no way around it. Uh, you yeah. know, if you're going to condition, you have to use the jaw and you have to be sensible about it. Don't don't punch bricks. You know, build up to whatever. If you're, if in the end you want to really have the iron palm, then you have to go through the steps to to get that. You just don't go, you know, crazy and just try to jump all your steps. They these these are things that are proven through a cycle. So nobody ever accomplished it. Uh, you can't get to Z without going through B. You know, mm -hmm. so do your steps. I, I would say, you know, be patient and follow your instructor's uh, your instructor's uh, guidance. You know, my yeah. one of my instructors, you know, uh, so during it, you know, during like weapons staff training, I would hit myself, and he's like, "Don't hit yourself." And and I didn't realize that he was just telling me because uh, his English was bad. He was a Chinese guy that. I should go slow enough to develop the technique as opposed to going all squirrely like I am and bashing myself in the head, <laughs> you know, with the staff. So yeah. you just don't, don't hit yourself means slow it down and do your technique properly so you don't hurt yourself. Right, right. Uh, hey, hey, I have a question for you because you've brought up flexibility a couple of times. Um, we have a flexibility and a flexibility liniment. Have you ever tried either of those? No. I didn't realize you guys have that. I got to check that out. Okay, yeah. We'll have to send you a sample of that. I think you'd really like that. Yeah. Because it sounds like, you know, in your um, training and stuff, that that is really key and important to, to teach that, you know, to properly stretch and be flexible and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's uh, really important any, whether it's a sport or a traditional martial art. You know, like uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you need a lot of tendon and muscle flexibility, and that mm -hmm. will say that gives you time to counter the technique. So without flexibility, a joint lock is applied really, really easy. Yeah. You know, so so and, and two, and and then for us, just you know, as as martial artists and trying to uh, different styles require different amounts of incredible flexibility. So yeah, I, I want to check that out. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. I know I need to take your advice because I'm always complaining that I'm not flexible, but I, I don't stretch enough. So that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. If, if, you, if you stretch, you'll get flexible. <laughs> Rule yeah. number four. <laughs> I love it. Uh, hey, we, we need to get, I want to list out your rules when we have um, our show notes page. Sorry to cut you yeah. off, Nick. But. Well, that's actually exactly what I was going to ask. If, if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd be really curious to hear the rules that that your students hear yeah well uh i i have some that i say and then some that i make up on the spot okay like uh like uh, uh, uh a rule is again uh exercise makes you tired uh stretching makes you more flexible you get better if you practice don't hit yourself or in general don't do that so <laughs> When somebody lands incorrectly from being thrown, they're like, oh, I hurt myself. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, take, you know, don't tr if, some, if you're in a class, don't fight being th resist too much being thrown. Because when you're learning, you can learn more from falling than, than the other guy learns from throwing you. You know, mm -hmm. the technique of throwing. So, that, so I kind of uh, say th uh, that. Don't do that. You know, when they're like, ouch, don't do that. You know, yeah. oh, I hit, I hit myself with the staff. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, I bash myself with a sword. Don't do that. So they sound they sound crazy for people. Don't do that until they realize like, oh, you know, I need to watch my technique. I need to watch the way I I fall. Maybe I shouldn't have resisted so much to make it so blunt, you know, because it's not always about being, you know, uh, uh, you know, not uh, being the hammer. Sometimes you have to be water and water can can shape. A mountain so different things like that and and to uh, being a traditional martial artist we do have the uh we are inspired by our metaphors of being 
which are are like uh, stand erect like a pine tree. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, land like a magpie. If you ever see a magpie, which is a huge bird, land on a small limb, it, it lands and the limb bends, but it doesn't fall from the limb. So, you know, soar like an eagle. An eagle can fly in the air for a long period of time. You know, uh, as, as still as a mountain, meaning a mountain is in its space still, but it could be immovable, you know, and which is like uh, uh, move like a wave or like water because water can move a mountain, which it can be unmovable. So we, we, in martial arts, we have these things called metaphors for being. Right. Right. But I love that because it's simple and people understand it because it is, you know? Yeah. But they're deep yeah. too, because, yeah. because until you really think about it, you think like, oh yeah, naturally if you practice, you get better. Mm-hmm. But that, but that means like, if you're not happy that you're not getting better, it's because you, you have not been true to yourself and practiced. Right. So yeah, it's kind of right. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I love to call those quotes deceptively simple, you know, because mm-hmm. surface yeah. level, you know, you, w- but it's when you really start to think, that's where the true understanding comes in. Yeah. And that's too for, for any art, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a professional musician, there's a lot of time you sacrifice to do that. You mm-hmm. know, your friends are saying, Hey, come out. And you're like, no, I got to go, you know, in my attic and practice guitar for three hours. You know, and then I'll eat something and then I'll practice again for three hours. So that is the yeah. that is the art. An artist does that, you know, draws right. for hours. You know, my brother and, and John uh, Tobias, the creator of Mortal Kombat, used to sit at my my mom's kitchen table or an other friend's kitchen table. And we'd be chatting or doing something, but they would be drawing a hand over and over and over again, looking at their hand, drawing it, looking at their hand from a different angle and drawing it. And that is... You know, that is what got them where they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that is the success, you know, like you said, you know, doing stuff when nobody's looking for no other reason than you really want to be doing it. That's, mm-hmm. yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, too. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry for, for taking up the whole conversation. But all good. My, my, uh, one of my instructors, at the time he used to do martial arts in China, there were only three professional martial arts teams in all of China. So they would pick a team out of regions. So, and two, it's China. So, you know, uh, two out of three people practice martial arts in China. <laughs> so when they're building a team, they built, the, it's really, really elite. So my, uh, my instructor, I'm giving him a plug, uh, Go Chenghua won an all around amateur title, but it was like, they were going to form more teams in mainland China. So whoever won these competitions would get to form a team in their province. So he won all around champion at the, and at that time you had to, uh, do forms, do weapons, forms, do, uh, hand forms, fight, fight with a weapon. So you really had to know your stuff. So he won first place in his division for doing all of that. Wow. So then the Chinese government was like, here's a bunch of money at the university uh, he was training at, and you get to build a team. So he said that when it was announced that Wuhan was, uh, which came out with the pandemic, but anyway, Wuhan was going to have a national (laughs) team. He said over 2,000 people came out to try out for the team. Wow. And he's like, and these 2,000 people were already the elite. <laughs> and so he was like, he was like, he was with his master, uh, Wen Jin Min, was one, which was one of the creators of modern contemporary uh, uh, wushu. So what you see now is designed by five famous masters. And he was one, his master was one of them. So uh, he was like, man, how are we going to go through these people? Because we only have a weekend to go through these people. And he was just like, first thing we do is you look at the person. When you're talking to them and giving them instructions, the people who are just standing in place, we cut. And the, other, the people that you see stretching or going like this or stretching their arms, we automatically take them and we, we move them to the next step. So he said within the first thing, we cut it down to 300 people from 2000 people. We cut it to 300 people just by talking and noticing who is moving and who is just standing and listening. He goes, because his thought was whoever's standing and listening 
will not do the extra time it takes to be good, super good. So even they didn't really even care if they were already super good. They had the potential to teach them to be to train better to to have their. To, they knew that if I turn my back on this student, this guy is going to do it until I tell him to stop. Wow. Training. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, so that's what it is to that whole uh, skill in in doing. And I, hopefully, I didn't stretch out that story too long. No, that was wow. fascinating. Are, are there any other, from going to the 300 to whoever made the team, did they have any sort of yes. other mindset things like that that they did? Um, they actually had skill. Man, I wish I wasn't on video. Uh, uh, they had other skill moves that they were like, do this one move. And anybody, because too, they, um, a martial art master can recognize another potential martial art master or another master just by one just by seeing him move you can see the body mind body connection through that and that's how like i made it to uh, uh master level is not by knowing one system everything in a system it was not only doing that but having that mind body connection in my in my practice uh so they picked out one move difficult move and if you can execute it really fast cleanly and sharply then you moved on to the next thing. And if you kind of hesitated, and two, it was it's difficult. You needed strength and flexibility, not only of the legs, but of the upper body, torso, to do it. Everybody sees a long fist pose. I don't know if you guys know it, but the hand is over the head, and the left hand's in a hook hand, kind of behind your back kind of thing. And then you're in, in what they call an empty stance, a low empty stance. So if you can do that movement, boom, in a flash of an eye, and stay steady, then you got to move on. And that too, cut it down to 25 people. Mm -hmm. So from the 200, wow. they went to 25 in one day. Wow. Because in the end, they only needed 12. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So you, you were talking within that a little bit about, actually, before you go on, I, I have to learn how they get 25 to 12, and then I'll ask the next question. <laughs> the, the 25 to 12 was whoever can survive they were they started doing a workout so whoever can last uh, to it, it it was in China like when I uh, trained in China I got it was okay to get hit by a stick mm -hmm. you know and it's just like a, a gymnastics in the old day if you uh, were on a US gymnastics team your Russian coach would hit you with a stick or hit you with his hand to because the corrections will come faster if there was a consequence which sounds kind of cruel but at a highest level of training, that is what needs to be done for a physical art. It's mm. just the it's just the way it is. You know, I think uh, I think there's a couple of movies where g gymnasts would say, you know, I recall in their interviews telling that that they used to get beat. So they got to 12 by having a grueling workout nonstop. Whoever passed out or stopped would be eliminated from from the 12. So from mm. the 25, the the 12 that would not stop or got it and they only and they only got it down to 18 on that day mm. so so then they thought of a worse workout the next day to try to get it down to 12 so it was really grueling because too you know that you know this is a uh, communist china so you know that if you represent the nation your whole family it gets taken care of so it was not only you making the team, but they knew that, guess what? My mother and father will get extra meals, better housing. My siblings will get a better education. They'll be able to go to university. My whole family is riding on my shoulders. And I am only 12 or 13 years old. Wow. And they wow. Understood. Yeah, they understood it. And so my, my follow-up to that, you know, I found that there is this big undertone of mindset. So... Do you personally do any sort of mindset training in your, your your personal martial arts life? And if so, could you elaborate on, on what you do? Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm 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 doing a, a book on Mortal Kombat. My uh, my uh, my story is about the making of Mortal Kombat, like us goofing around. And I'm going to cross it with uh, with chapters on. Uh, I'm going to call them the, I haven't really figured out what to call them, but there are the illusions of martial arts. Like a lot of people think like empty your mind. Empty your mind is not, you can't just empty your mind. 
But what, what you do is there is a series of exercises of breathing. First, you listen to your breathing. Then you pace your breathing. Then you learn uh, to hold, uh, like there's a, there's a term in Chinese martial arts, internal martial arts, that's called, you hold your presence in your Dantian. And a lot of people are like, you think about your Dantian, how do you hold your presence in your Dantian? And basically it is, you, you take, you relax your breath, you suck in your belly, and while you keep your belly sucked in, you push out your belly from the front and from the back. So if uh, later on, just try to do that. Be like, okay, I'm gonna suck in my belly, but I'm gonna keep it sucked in and push my belly out front and push out through my back. And you're going to realize that that exercise is gonna call, call all attention to what you're doing and it's gonna empty your mind. So empty your mind is, is different than people really think it is. So, so I am going, that, that is one of the things that I do before, uh, actually any internal martial art, has that in it uh, as well as as to regulate your breathing and also to keep your center of mass contracted and ready to pop because everything comes from your abdominal and your your uh area uh outward are the biggest muscles so if mm -hmm. you use your biggest muscles to contract you you can hit harder so hopefully that mm -hmm. makes sense hopefully yeah. that, that makes sense so now that is, let us know in the books you're at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have different things like that and different things like uh, another thing is like, which is to do with your actual product is when you're draining iron palm in the old days, because you're hitting iron and steel, that resident, that, that uh, your body absorbs part of that, part of that uh, iron into your skin. So your, your hand can really become a thing of iron and without Without Tao Chao, you won't be able to use your hand for anything else but smacking things, you know, because you'll lose uh, the mobility of it. So it's important for when you actually do iron palm training that you use the liniment because that increases the circulation. And so that helps get the, that, the residue of that iron out of, your, out of your body because it can be harmful. So uh, things like that. Yeah, things like that. That's why you need a proper Chao in iron palm training or just in general training because you're... Mm -hmm body will absorb that uh, steel, that mineral. Wow. I never heard of that before. That makes perfect sense, though. Yeah. But yeah. 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 And again, that's an illusion or a myth of mm -hmm. martial arts. People are like, oh, I have iron, iron palm. Well, you could really have an iron palm, which, yeah. is, which is not really what you want because you won't be able to wipe your butt because you can't <laughs> <your> fingers. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah that, which is not, you know, right, that's really not what you want to focus on doing, even right. though you even though some of it will stay in your skin, the majority will leave your body and you'll be able to use your hands uh, to, you know, do calligraphy or draw or even right. play video games. But anyway, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's one of those things. Are there any other health practices that you do when, like at home before you get to the gym, like a morning routine or anything? Um, well, uh, they, I try to obey, here's a, uh, the, the Eastern Bloc countries came out with a stretching routine that's embraced a lot. Now I see it. They retitled it over and over again. But it, this is what helped me get the splits for if you ever play Mortal Kombat, you see Johnny Cage is notorious for dropping in the split and mm -hmm. punching, pe punching people in the, the nuts. <laughs> and, if, and, and if you look at that up, you'll see, actually see me. I've, I've put, posted videos online of me slowly going in the splits. Because again, the technology didn't let, let me allow me to just drop in the splits. I had to do it slow so that way the camera could capture each frame very clean, uh, uh, the movement. Otherwise, it, it would be like blurry in the video game. So I did it really, really slow, and that is that is part of that that uh, that program that they came out with, which is called scientifically stretching. There was a video on it, and in the morning before you brush your teeth or you're in, or do anything. Uh, you're supposed to do these dynamic stretches that keep you flexible the whole day. So that's one mm -hmm. of the things I do in the morning. Uh, when I'm do done, usually after that, I put on the jiao and I do my iron palm training. And then I usually have my coffee and then I have a, later on I'll have a breakfast. But those are the things for sure that I, I do those, try to do those every day. Is to do that, uh, that stretching, 
that uh, iron palm training and then do a little mindful meditation, hold the presence in the Dantian and try to do my, uh, do my martial art postures. They call them postures. Uh, different ways to hold your dynamic tension, I guess. Uh, yeah. The word for it. Yeah. So mm-hmm. kind of like kind of like yoga, but for martial arts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is there anything that would people would be surprised about in your in your habits? Maybe not so healthy habits. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. People, people, uh, uh, people are like, "Wow, you're because I'm 62." So <laughs> a lot of a lot of people are like, uh, "Oh, you're you're in really good shape." That's just because I exercise a lot because my dieting is terrible <laughs> <laughs> because I still kind of basically eat. Yeah, I try to eat organic, but I still eat like meat and I still eat, you know, uh, you know, uh, I eat fish. So I'm not a vegetarian. I eat kind of what I want. I still like to have a cocktail, you know, mm-hmm. though, I, though I try to stay away from beer. I'll go for vodka or whiskey, something with a little less sugar or something like that. So I try to I'm not as healthy as, you know, when people see me eat, they're like, man, you're not really healthy. But, (laughs) uh, well, I'm not, I I just try to have, uh, for me, I try to just enjoy life and not do too many things excessive because I'm already doing excessive things with the martial art thing. I don't need my whole life to be crazy. You know, Mm -hmm. it it could, if you start thinking too much, you could have your whole life just controlled by your eating and your exercising. And that's, you know, you have to do that in the moderation that you think is moderate you know, other people might think like, oh, that's excessive. Or other people might think that that's not enough. But that's right. not, that's their own business. Yeah. And, and that's one of the lessons in, in that I give my students. Another uh, quote, mind your own business, Kung Fu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you don't worry about what the person next to you is, how many times they do it or how low they do it or how hard they hit. You just do your own business. Just do it yeah. to, to whatever your body can do it is what the goal is. Yeah. You, can't, you know, this is not a competition. You know, yeah. it, it, it is about you. Uh, uh, another thing, I, I use the phrase consciousness through combat. You just, you're, it sounds like two opposing things, but in reality, you're using the exercise to be conscious of the technique, which will make you conscious of the body, which will make you conscious to uh, what you want to reflect on other people. You know, mm-hmm. uh, and you too, it's not, we're not saints. So you can't help everybody, but you should be helpful when you can. And right. two, in turn, you have to learn to accept help from others. So, uh-huh. yeah, it's kind yeah. of weird. Yeah, I sound like an old guy. So no, I'm looking forward to the book. I'm telling you, the, the, uh, uh, this is great advice. Yeah. So, so what other um, endeavors are you working on? First, wait, before we go into that, how many hours are you training a day, would you say? Uh, uh, I, uh, I personally... Like during the pandemic, it's kind of slowed me down because in the morning after I did what I described, I would go to the gym and lift a little weights and do a little cardio, maybe for an hour, hour and a half. And then I'd go train in martial arts for myself for two hours. And then I'm a hands-on guy. So when I teach, I, I watch them, but I also do it with them. So they know that way they have, uh, that way they have, uh, for lack of word, uh, uh, something like, a, they know like. Holy cow! He, when he tells me to do a hundred sit-ups, mm-hmm. I'll, I, I'll do it with you. I won't just say you do it, and I will just watch you. No, I'll I'll do that with you. Anything that I know is challenging, I mm-hmm. I will do with my students. So to t- kind of inspire them to be like, oh, that way, oh, if if the old, you know, a lot of times when they uh, my students want to give up, I'm like, if the old guy can do it, mm-hmm. you can do it because yeah. you know, if they're whether they're six or whether they're 55 that's still younger than me so you got you got to also do it you know yeah you can't, you can't let the old guy beat you that's yeah. awesome yeah. yeah so i will train like that throughout the day with different clients private clients or with the class i'll mm-hmm. i'll actually do a lot of things with them yeah oh, i'm sure they love that about you <laughs> yeah, it's, it's craziness it's crazy yeah yeah i wouldn't uh uh, and, uh, again, and that is my, uh, I chose that for my life and I wouldn't recommend it for everyone's life. Mm-hmm. So you have to really be mindful and think if that's what you want, then you should do it. If mm-hmm. you want to take it a little more casually, that's all right. You, you know, it's still enjoying the art that I do. So I, I really like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, before we wrap up, I just want others to know how they can get in touch with you and yeah. then find out anything that you're working on that you'd like us to know about. You mentioned your book that you are getting ready to 
Yeah, well, I, I, tell us where you're at in that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, on uh, Instagram, I'm Master D Piscina, and uh, Twitter is Master Piscina, and Facebook is also Master Piscina. Uh, my website is Master Piscina, so my brand is really Master Piscina. Uh-huh. It, and, and two, that's more of a brand than who I am because I, I uh, it's uh, uh, people like to uh, uh, study under uh, 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 until they really get deep into the martial arts. They they like to see that uh, that veil as master, you know, mm-hmm. and when they when they 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 like that. So they do that. Uh, so you can reach out to me, whether it's a martial art question or just a general question about the video game or life or anything mm-hmm. like that. You know, again, we're dr- going through a str- strange time. So even if you want to say, hey, hi, you know, send me a message. I, I'm usually usually good at responding to general messages from people. I'm terrible on the business end. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's why it took us so long to hook up. No, no, no. Yeah, we're but good. too. Yeah, and two recently, I I, uh, I got approached about maybe uh, doing a, a retro fighting game. So hopefully wow. it's through, and you'll see me again doing a, a martial art video game. Oh, excellent! Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. You know, this, this was great. This was now you're you're an awesome guy to talk to. I think that your students are are very lucky, as well as everybody, because. You crave us Johnny Cage, so thank you for your contributions. This was a great conversation. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Yeah. T- you too, Janelle. Thank you for having and, being patient. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. And I hope I was excited to share more of your martial arts side with people and not just focus in on, you know, the Mortal Kombat Johnny Cage, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think it's good for people to see all of you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, we're excited to share this podcast, and um, people can come, ch- come check it out at plumdragonherbs.com, and we'll post show notes and um, ways to connect with you there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks, you guys. For- and thanks to all of our listeners for joining us today. And if you liked what you heard today, be sure to click the subscribe button, leave us a comment, and rate us on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen. By doing this, more people will have a chance to hear what our amazing guests have to share. Until next time.